Life begins with the adoption of our father's name, a tradition which has survived for over a thousand years. But this tradition has been somewhat different in Wales. What does it mean? What is its history? We propose to discover exactly what's in a name. Hello, my name is Lewis. My name is Geraint Jones. My name is Davis. My name is Sean. My name is Jenkins. My name is Leanne Jones. My name is Teddy Gwynn. My name is Ngharad Hughes. My name is Tina Williams. Uh, Richard Edward Jones. In a sense, I would say that one of the best things about being Welsh is that you are a very accurate paradigm of the human condition in general. Once you start to study the history of Welsh families and Welsh family names and their surnames, you've got a clue to the whole history of the country. Why don't you join the great band of people who are trying to trace their Welsh ancestry? It can be challenging, but very satisfying. And we're here to give you a helping hand. A nation strong on culture, strong on identity, strong on character. Remarkable for a small country on the western edge of Europe. But who are the people that created it? Who are the Welsh? The modern Welsh. That's who we are the remnants of the ancient Britons. Now, if your name is Williams or Davis or Lewis or Morgan or Roberts or Jenkins or Jones or Llewellyn, indeed Cadwallader, then you have something in common with those people down there, the Welsh. Your name, like it or not, is a secret code. And when we crack that code, we can rediscover our history, our heritage, our identity. Of course, the names we call ourselves can be misleading. Take Wales, for example. Wales isn't a Welsh word. It's an old Anglo-Saxon word meaning foreigner. And yet we still use it. Strange that we should still call ourselves foreigners in a land we've lived in for thousands of years. In our own language, the word for ourselves is Cymru, meaning compatriots. And it is this bond of friendship and loyalty that has held the Cymru, the Welsh, together through the centuries. Whether our people are here in Wales or across the waves in the Americas or Australasia, the bond of friendship and loyalty and belonging remain strong and true. It's little wonder that those bonds have remained so resilient. We share our surnames with the world. They bind us together across great distances, from Pittsburgh to Pontypridd, from Canberra to Cardiff. And then there's the matter of Wales itself, its mountains, lakes, history and heritage. It's a country which exercises a powerful hold, a magnetic sense of attachment and longing. We call it Hiraith that is almost impossible to break. Welsh people have a highly developed sense of locality, which is, on the face of it, strange, because Wales is not a big country. It's less than 200 miles from north to south. Yet there's nothing modest about its scenic variety. Your name has echoed among the mountains for centuries, and you share an ancient pride in a land unique in the beauty of its landscapes. 
When you come to Wales, the wide proliferation of your own name will amaze and delight you. In the cities, towns and villages, you're bound to feel very much at home. And what of the people who live here? Well, at the risk of sounding grossly self-indulgent, we like to think that we are something special too. For a start, there's our language, one of the oldest surviving tongues in Europe. Our love of the landscape and our commitment to the culture and traditions of this ancient land. We are a people, city dwellers as well as country folk, who feel, first and foremost, Welsh. This commitment finds enthusiastic expression at Eisteddfodau, folk festivals of music, dance, poetry and drama. Our national Eisteddfod, a week-long celebration which takes place in August, is matched only by the hugely successful youth that is the Irv Eisteddfod which takes place in midsummer. the Esteddfod field, you feel part of a big extended family. But if you want to find out more about your own family, then you need to know how names can help you unlock the door to your past. A thousand years ago, the peoples of Europe based their names on such things as their occupation, their land, or often a distinctive physical feature. But the people of Wales went their own way, as exemplified by the name of this winning Esteddfod poet, Robin Lloyd Abawain. Unique to this country and to the people of Welsh descent is the fact that almost all Welsh names were inherited from that of the father. The Welsh system was documented by the 12th century chronicler Geraldus Cambrensis, who wrote, Even the common people retain the genealogy and can not only readily recount the names of their grandfather and great-grandfathers, but even refer back to the sixth or seventh generation or beyond them in this manner. Priest, son of Griffith, son of Rhys, son of Tidir, son of Cadell, son of Rhodri Maur, and so on. Priest, up Griffith, up Llewellyn, up Yorworth, up Cadwallader, up Griffith, up Cadwallader, etc., etc. The patronymic system, the system of naming, whereby the son adopts his father's name continually from one generation to the next, down through the ages. Unfortunately, I'm not an expert on this subject, but I know a man who is. A leading authority in the Welsh naming system is the eminent historian Dr. Pris Morgan. The strange system that the Welsh had of knowing one another in their own village communities, their own uh, native communities, was uh, based upon the given name of the person himself or herself, and the father's name, and the grandfather's name, and maybe several ancestors going back. What you did was to take your own given name, say, uh, Thomas, and then have your father's given name, say, Griffith, your grandfather's name, perhaps another Thomas or Richard, and you, you linked these by a little particle called Ap. You, so you were Thomas, Ap Griffith, Ap Thomas. And the Ap was a shortened form of the Welsh word Mab or Map, meaning son of. So it was a very simple patronymic, it was a true patronymic system of naming. You counted for nothing in Welsh native society during the Middle Ages unless you could prove uh, to everybody in your community how you were descended from a forefather several generations back. You were a member of a, a gwely, literally a bed, and you had to prove to yourself and all your cousins, you know, third, fourth, fifth cousins removed and so on, how you were descended from this forefather, because every few generations all the family gathered together to have a share out of the kin group's land. And those who didn't have any children, who were childless, gave up their, their land. And those who had too many children had to have a share out. So uh, there, there was that basic reason for, for 
showing everybody that you were Thomas, uh, Hap Griffith, Ab Thomas, and so on, going back to this forefather. And the other reason was, in Welsh native society, when uh, a distant cousin of yours stole a sheep, you were expected to pay part of his fine. And when you stole a sheep, you expected all your cousins, for several degrees, to pay your fine. And so it all helped to keep the peace and to make everybody co-responsible for crime. It was a very effective system, but it did mean that for lots of different reasons, uh, the really important thing about you was not whether you had brown hair or whether you were a smith or whether you had strong arms. Or, or, or that sort of thing. You, you might have those things and people might talk about them as nicknames in colloquial speech. But the important thing about you, the only thing that gave you status in that society was your father's name and your grandfather's name and your forefather's names. So it is quite clear that the patronymic system was inbuilt. Ancient burial sites called Cromlechs can be found all over Wales. The history of the Stone Age peoples who built them is shrouded in mystery. We have no records to tell us anything of their language, of how they communicated. But we do have these intriguing monuments which inspire us to speculate how our ancestors viewed life and death. Standing close to these monuments, we can, if you are lucky, catch a tantalizing glimpse of the spirit of long lost eras. A whiff of the he that hedrith, the magic and enchantment that has pervaded Wales since ancient times. One of the finest megalithic monuments in Wales is Pentra Ivan Cromlech in the green Priscelli hills of Pembrokeshire. We know little of its makers. Nevertheless, they must have been a mischievous lot. One wonders whether in leaving us these insoluble riddles was perhaps an early example of the cunning and the humour, which it is said, now characterises the Welsh. The names by which they called each other have disappeared forever. But all is not lost. It is almost certain that their descendants are still with us today, and that the stories they told have been passed down by mouth over the centuries. We owe the Celts a great deal. They moved westwards from Central Europe into many parts, arriving in Britain in the centuries before the birth of Christ. The Celtic tribes left an indelible mark on the country. The patronymic system of naming is probably of Celtic origin. Their culture was the bedrock of the Welsh nation, so much so that we, the people of Wales, have always proudly considered ourselves to be Celts and attach a great importance to our Celtic roots. These people ruled from about 500 BC until the coming of the Romans. They lived in settlements such as the reconstructed village of Castellhentlis, Pembrokeshire. The height of Iron Age luxury. Mistakenly regarded as barbarians by Julius Caesar, the Celts were a colourful and warlike people with strong religious beliefs based on Druidic law, a civilization which achieved a high degree of artistic excellence. Regardless of what old Julius said, I think I would have enjoyed living among these people. Hmm? <laughs> then again, maybe not. In AD 43, the Romans invaded Britain. Within 30 years, they commanded the land we now know as Wales. Whether they conquered Wales in the true sense of the word is open to doubt for the impenetrable highlands remained the domain of the native tribes, and resistance was strong. The Romans departed 400 years later, their empire in ruins. 
but they left a land which was independent, Christian and Brythonic speaking. Welsh, if you like. We, the Cambrians, were now the custodians of all that was best of the Romano-British legacy. Perhaps the most important factor was a newly inherited Christian faith. The Roman legions had successfully kept out the pagan invaders from the continent. But once they had left, fighting off the heathen Angles and Saxons became our major preoccupation. Inspired by our leaders, heroic figures, amongst them the great King Arthur himself, our native culture flourished. And the concept of Wales, Cymru, as a nation, began to emerge. Well, I think the origin of uh, the idea of a Welsh nation is, um, lies at that moment uh, in uh, the history of Western Europe when the Roman Empire collapsed in the front of uh, its barbarian invasions, which swept through uh, the whole of Western Europe, right down to Spain, Portugal, and so on. There was a longer resistance in the British Isles, and uh, it's out of this resistance to barbarian invasion, as it were, that uh, the Welsh identity emerged, and it emerged in an essentially uh, Christian form because uh, the invaders were either pagan or heretics. The British, that is the Cambro-British, that is the Welsh as we call them now, uh, took upon themselves a kind of glamorous mantle. And the glamorous mantle was uh, the remnants of Romanitas, that is the Roman heritage in religion and in culture. And although they were uh, small in number and uh, hanging on by the skin of their teeth, as it were, in the uh, western peninsula called Wales, they nevertheless thought of themselves as the inheritors of the Roman tradition, and uh, therefore you could call them, from the very beginning, a small nation with big ideas. St. David, the cathedral city of our patron saint David, or Dewi, as we call him in Welsh. Dewi lived in the middle of the great age of British saints, in the 5th and 6th centuries, when the nascent state of Wales began to affirm itself as an independent and unique entity. 1,500 years later, Wales is still peppered with religious sites dedicated to the saints of this time. Dyfrig, Ichdid, Garmon, Cadog, Padarn, and a host of others. By the way, such was the importance of St. David's that Pope Calixtus II honored this place by decreeing that two pilgrimages here were equivalent to one pilgrimage to Rome. In the troubled times after the departure of the Romans, the Christian faith underpinned Celtic resistance to the Angles and Saxons. Indeed, it can be argued that a distinctive Welsh nation began to emerge from the battles fought between the Celtic Christians and the heathen invaders. The continuity of Christian worship over the centuries saw some early religious sites become abbeys, priories and cathedrals in medieval times. But long before the Middle Ages, another event was to have a profound effect on the shaping of the Welsh nation. In the 8th century, the Mercian king Offa built a great earthen dike to keep the British Celts and the Anglo-Saxons apart. The border helped define Wales as a separate country. Wales was by now beginning to assume the mantle of a nation-state. Rhodri Mawr, Rhodri the Great, won a famous victory over Viking invaders in the 9th century. His grandson, Hoel Dda, Hoel the Good, gave Wales its first unified code of laws. Celt and Saxon lived an uneasy, grudging coexistence. But soon, a new order was to sweep all before it. 1066 is one of the best known dates in history. It marked the beginning of the Norman conquest. Within just a few years, the Normans ruled England. In Wales, the story was a little different. 
Like the Romans before them, the Normans never fully conquered Wales. They did come very close to it, though. Built by the Norman English king, Edward I, this imposing fortress here at Harlech is one of a series of many castles in what is referred to as the Iron Ring. Built by these invaders between the 12th and the 14th centuries, the, the very existence of so many colossal fortifications in such a small country gives ample testimony to the strength and fierceness of the Welsh resistance. The stronger the servant, the bigger the stick. Despite the strength of their castles, the Anglo-Norman invasion of Wales was always a partial affair. The Welsh retreated to their mountain strongholds, to rocky Snowdonia, where their own castles, Dol Badarn and Dol Ellen, were located. The resistance was steadfast, even in the face of overwhelming odds. But against the might of the Anglo-Normans, military success was in short supply. Yet through it all, the Welsh culture remained intact. This can be seen from the way in which the Welsh still continued to use the patronymic system of naming. Of course, one of the things that helped people in the medieval Welsh society to distinguish one another was the very large variety of given names, Christian names or baptismal names that the Welsh had. First of all, they had a huge variety of native heroic names, often of pagan uh, gods in origin, names like Gwalchmai, the Hawk of May, or Gwalhaved, Hawk of Summer, names like Llewellyn, uh, Griff, Griffith, meaning um, Griffin Lord, and so on, names like that. Then on top of that, they had, um, they had um, uh, medieval, say, royal names like Rhys and Morgan, names like that. Then on top of that, they had uh, a whole variety of biblical names, just as you would have had in any, in any uh, Christian society in the Middle Ages, biblical names like Matthew and Philip. Thomas and so on. And on top of that, then you had Norman names like um, Fulk and Piers um, and names like Franco and so on that had come in with the Norman conquerors. Then you had medieval English kings' names on top of that, th names like Richard and Gwilym from William the Conqueror. Um, you had names like Edward. Uh, these had come in. And you also have um, a lot of names that are very, very... Uh, those were names in general use throughout medieval Wales, but you also have quite a lot of Christian names that are very, very localized. This, is, this, is, this helps uh, people or, or who have got names derived from these localized names to find their family origins much more easily than anybody else. Just as Dolwyth Ellan, the stronghold of the native Welsh princes, stood for a separate Welsh identity, so too did Wales's dogged adherence to the patronymic system. And it's, it's odd that they didn't take uh, fixed surnames for another reason, that they had all the elements of fixed surnames colloquially amongst themselves. The Welsh in the Middle Ages were quite prepared to call one another by names like the English Armstrong, for example, the kind of nickname or, or the trade name like Smith that gives rise to dozens of, of surnames in England. They were quite prepared to use these as nicknames. Uh, Sean Gorv, John the Smith, Sean Grach, John the Scabby, Sean Bendew, John the Fathead. That was quite a, a common way of referring to one another in the village community. But it just wasn't considered by them to be a name, a proper name that you could take uh, a surname from. They had their own system of, of knowing one another in native Welsh society, which was quite different and very peculiar. So Wales and Welsh culture lived on, despite the military supremacy of the English. But one last fateful episode in the Welsh resistance to English rule was yet to unfold. 
On September the 16th, 1400, Owain Glyndwr, Lord of Glyndwrdwy, a little village between Corwen and Llangollen, was declared Prince of Wales by a small group of his family and friends. The English overreacted. Penal legislation and heavy taxes were introduced. Four years later, Glyndwr had taken Conwy, Harlech, Aberystwyth and Cardiff castles, laid siege to Carnarvon and called an independent Welsh Parliament here at Machantleth. And by the way, given his name to many an illustrious and noble institution. There's a lot of myself for overreacting. The years that followed Glyndwr's rebellion were ones of great hardship. During that time, a free man by the name of Owain Tidir of Penmanith in Anglesey married the widowed queen of Henry V of England. Fifty-six years later, Owain's grandson, Harry, or Henry, returning from exile in France, landed near here in the shadow of his birthplace, Pembroke Castle. He marched for 15 days, gathering an army as he went, and defeated King Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485. Harry Tidir, Henry Tudor, had himself crowned King of England. And for the first time ever, the halls and corridors of the English Royal Court reverberated to the commands and cadences of a Welsh-speaking king. Yes, history has a way of throwing up strange ironies. A Welshman, Harry Tidir, Henry VII, found the mighty Tudor dynasty of English monarchs. His son, Henry VIII, bans the use of Welsh in the courts and passes a series of anti-Welsh laws, amongst them an attempt to force the Welsh to adopt fixed surnames. The Welsh started to take on a system of fixed surnames, basically from 1485 onwards, during the Tudor period. And in some senses, they were following the example set them by their own rulers. The Tudor dynasty, after all, had, uh, were amongst the earliest people to take on a fixed surname. Henry VII, King Henry VII, in Welsh chronicles, is simply called Harry Ab Edmund uh, Ab Owen Ab Maredydd Ab Tidir. Uh, his grandfather, Henry's grandfather, Owen Tudor, was the first to take the, f the fixed surname, and Owen Tudor took his grandfather's name rather than his father's name, Maredydd, because the, the, he, the grandfather, Tidir of Penmanydd, on the island of Anglesey, had been a very well-known figure in those circles, and uh, so England was spared a Meredith uh, or Meredith dynasty and was given a Tudor dynasty. The English clerks coming into Wales, um, the legal system was changing, all put pressure upon the Welsh to adopt uh, fixed surnames after the English manner. And that was the general fashion, was to take your father's um, baptismal name and take it on as a fixed surname uh, and pass it on usually or very often with the addition of an S. And the S is the English genitive S, just as you talk about the boys' caps, the bakers' loaves, that's the genitive S. Well, the same thing was done with uh, Welsh surname. If, if you were Thomas, the son of Griffith, Thomas Ap Griffith, and you were asked to take on a fixed surname, you drop the Ap in general, and you simply add an S to the end of the Griffith and become Thomas Griffiths to show that you are Thomas possessed in some way by Griffith. If you were, were Griffith ap Richard, Griffith the son of Richard, you simply called yourself Griffith and you took as a fixed surname Richard plus S, which gives you Richards. And that was 90%, uh, I think, of, the, um, of these uh, fixed surnames are formed in that way. The traditional system of naming was being attacked on all fronts. Persuasive forces for change were even affecting the Welsh aristocracy who, in previous generations, had been custodians of a separate Welsh culture. Well, the victory of the Tudors, as it were, uh, was a victory for the myth uh, of the loss of Britain and the regaining of Britain, which had uh, sustained the Welsh warrior aristocracy throughout the Middle Ages. When the victory was won, uh, it relieved this 
class of people, this leading class, the aristocracy, of the responsibility of preserving the native independence and of, uh, of safeguarding the culture and the ways of the Welsh as a separate people. And it opened up the route to a much more prosperous future as being part of the English central state. And uh, what happened in effect was that there was a sort of mass desertion of the people who would have been in former times responsible for uh, manning uh, the gates, as it were, and, and preserving the independence of the people, so that the lower classes were left uh, virtually defenceless against uh, a whole rhythm of change, which, uh, uh, as it were, reached a climax in 1536 when the Act of Union exiled the Welsh language um, from the courts of law and from all the processes of government and virtually uh, relegated into uh, oblivion. But the language did not die. In the reign of Elizabeth I, a leading Welsh churchman played a crucial role in securing the future of the Welsh language. In the 16th century, a Welsh cleric walked these leafy lanes here in the beautiful Ceiriog Valley. That is, when he wasn't putting his immense Greek and Latin scholarship to use in a task which was to have the greatest influence in preserving our language. The translation of the Bible by Bishop William Morgan in 1588 was indeed a momentous event. The bringing of the word of the Lord to the Welsh in their own tongue not only strengthened the faith of an already religious people, but also reinforced a culture based on language. Religious fervor gripped the people for 300 years and the Welsh took naturally to dissension, evangelism and non-conformity. However, the established church continued to flourish also. And it is only from old Punish records that we can hope to trace our Welsh ancestry in this period. The would-be genealogist would notice that the Welsh had seen fit to eagerly adopt the names that were tumbling out of the good book. This is how we have come to claim many a Luke, John, Mark, Daniel, Samuel, and the list goes on. Today's children are still called by those same ever popular Christian names of old. These youngsters, there's bound to be a John or a Daniel amongst them, enjoy acting the part of children before them, dressing up in period costume at the Welsh Folk Museum. We, the Welsh, like our Irish cousins, have always had itchy feet, that pioneer within us. Back in the 12th century, Madoc, a North Wales prince, weary of the factional power struggle at home and the oppression of the Norman invaders, along with his brother Hirid and a handful of followers, took ship and sailed westwards towards the edge of the world. Later centuries saw many such adventurers sailing the seven seas, and gallant Welsh frontiersmen were largely responsible for mapping the American interiors. Several such travelers strongly maintained that they encountered a tribe of Indians who were not only familiar with the name of the great Welshman Madoc, but who also conversed eloquently in them. Guess what? This myth uh, was used uh, quite uh, brazenly, really, by the Tudors, and particularly by Queen Elizabeth and by uh, her navigator, a man called John Dee, in order to set up the claims of the Crown of London, as it were, uh, the English Crown, in other words, on the basis of the fact that Queen Elizabeth was a descendant of Madoc and that she had more right to the North America than, say, the Spaniards. Um, this myth was used uh, as very effective propaganda by the Tudors and the Elizabethans, and later on, the same myth exactly was used by Thomas Jefferson, who claimed to be of Welsh descent. He said his ancestors were born in the shadow of Snowdon, which is just around the corner here. 
and Jefferson used the myth again to uh, create the manifest destiny of the United States. Welsh influence was to crop up in the most unlikely of places. In the way, for example, that the 18th century Welsh thinkers helped draft the American Constitution. And in the setting up of a Welsh community at the very end of the earth in distant Patagonia. The Welsh uh, did emigrate, of course, in the 19th century, together with other people in the British Isles, but they didn't emigrate in very large numbers during the time of industrialization because there was plenty of work for them at home. But it's got to be remembered that the Welsh emigrated uh, really to New England and to America from about 1600 onwards. And since they were there right at the beginning, and since they uh, stuck to fairly well-known surnames like Williams, Edwards, Price and Morgan and Thomas and so on, uh, these names fanned out from New England from a very, very early date. And so you find very large proportion of American surnames are of Welsh origin, simply because of this fact that the Welsh were there from 1600. And indeed, uh, in certain uh, states of America, for example, in North Carolina, there are almost 10% of the surnames in 1790, at the beginning of the first census of, of America in 1790, almost 10% of the population of North Carolina was, uh, had, had uh, fairly common uh, Welsh surnames. If religious descent was the first great movement to sweep 18th century Wales, then the second was industrialization. Wales was a land rich in raw materials, coal, lead, copper, slate and iron. In North Wales, huge slate mines provided building material for new towns and cities. In the south, countless collieries were sunk, in which armies of miners toiled to keep the world's steam engines, ship's boilers and blast furnaces stoked with coal. But the Industrial Revolution brought with it many threats. It was the rapid growth of industrialization which could have destroyed us more than anything else, perhaps. Our names and our identity. The new industrialized centers had an insatiable appetite for labor, which was satisfied by an eager workforce which poured in from rural Wales and elsewhere to the coal mines, the steelworks and the factories. Although the culture in the new industrialized areas remained distinctly Welsh, English was used more and more. Inevitably, the patronymic system declined as anglicized clerks grappled with traditional names when entering them on parish registers. For example, the, the native Welsh name Ryverch, Ryverch, R-H-Y-D-D-E-R-C-H. Now, that's an extremely difficult name for an English clerk to write down. It, it, it would baffle him, wouldn't it? Ryverch. Just think of it. Ap Ryverch, son of Ryverch. Impossible to write down in English. So what you do is to approximate it to a name that sounds rather similar to it, something like Roderick. Or if you want to keep the Ap Ryverch, you turn it into Prothero or Prothero. So, uh, a lot of these fixed surnames are, in fact, Welsh Christian names, but approximated, so they sound much more English than they were in origin. Well, now, if, if the father's generation has got... Uh, if the lot of the fathers in each parish have got names like John and David and Henry and Charles, then the children in the next generation who are asked to take fixed surnames are going to say, well, my father's name is, is John. 
And so, therefore, um, the parish clerk says, well, you must be called uh, Thomas Jones in that case. And since there were thousands of people by the late 18th century, there were thousands of children given the name John, especially in West Wales and North Wales. There were, since there were thousands of, of children being given the name John, it follows logically that in the next generation, when that family comes to fix its surname, they're going to be Jones. And so, in areas, say, Llanllechid in Carnarvonshire, about a fifth of the population are Joneses, and a large number of the of, of those Joneses are John Joneses. It was called um, a perpetual incognito. One thing that cuts across this great army of Joneses is the fact that a large number of Welsh families did decide to retain, as part of their fixed surname, the ap particle. So that uh, in several areas of Wales, instead of getting howells, uh, you have ap Powell forming the fixed surname, and that gives rise to a very large number of families called Powell or Rees. Instead of taking uh, Rees or Rice, uh, you tend to get the app added to it, and that gives a large number of uh, families called Price. Uh, of course, before a vowel, you tend to get Ab, not App, and therefore a large number of Owen families in certain parts of Wales, instead of becoming Owen or Owens, they have Ab Owen, and that gives rise to the family fixed surname of Bowen, which is quite common in, in some parts. You've got to be a detective to find your way through the twists and turns of the language maze, which leads you to your ancestors. One good source of guidance is in Aberystwyth, the National Library, where many old records are kept. If you're thinking of tracing your family history, getting started is half the battle. You'll get a lot of fun out of it, and as the, uh, the project grips you, your enthusiasm will take over. So make sure that you're organized from the very beginning. Perhaps you'll get the, the initial uh, information from your oldest living relatives. Maybe you'll get it from books like the Family Bible, or books which have come down from generation to generation through the family. Have a look inside these books. Maybe there'll be notes written on fly leaves or in the margins of pages. Make sure that you research fully what you've got in your own family. Initially, it should be easy for you to go back two or three generations. Then you can take it further with different sets of records, like parish records. Uh, these are available. You need to know which parish your people came from. You should be looking all the time for people's names, what they did, their vital dates, when were they born, when did they get married, who were they married to, where did they marry, where did they die, when did they die, where are they buried? Because you could find vital information on the gravestone that is a sort of record in itself. For researching further from the data you've collected from your family, the official records in Wales, England and Wales, will take you back to 1837. These are the indexes to births, marriages and deaths and census returns. But there are plenty of records and uh, people who are willing to help you with your project. If you get in touch with family history societies, which uh, cover every part of Wales, the different counties, or if you get in touch with the National Library of Wales, they can give you an idea of the sources which are available for looking further into your family. An awareness of our past also helps to secure our future. Genealogy is part of this process. In tracing our ancestors, we build up a picture of where we come from and of who we really are. Ecology, culture and language are 
intimately connected. I mean, they are the way in which a man responds to the environment immediately around him. Um, so that there is a connection between the land, the landscape, the language uh, in the Welsh context. And it seems to me that the language is the first line of defence. Not only the first line of defence, but also the one sure guarantee of a future because it is in the language and out of the language that the seeds of renewal have sprung throughout the centuries. History shows us this very clearly. Our identity remains intact, confident and resilient. Welsh culture in all its aspects continues to flourish against the background of the traditions of this ancient land, which, like our surnames, have passed down through the ages. In each generation there, from say about 1750 to about, oh, really 1898, you could say, at the end of the last century, lots of Welsh families were taking what looks like a surname, a fixed surname, on the surface. But when you scratch it, you realize it is only the given name of the father, and it is changing in each generation. But I can't think really of any examples, you know, after people born in the late 19th century. It's very, very rare uh, by that time. But it, it does lend uh, great variety and colour, it seems to me, uh, to the Welsh surnaming system. And it reminds us really of how very uneasy the Welsh relationship with fixed surnames really is. Amen. Well then, what's in a name? Clearly in Wales, it is the key with which we can unlock our sometimes glorious and mostly mysterious past. Now, the responsibility for carrying our traditions into the 21st century will fall upon the Joneses and Jenkinses, the Morgans, Lewises and Davises of today, the Hughes and Heavens, the Kerrys, Kerrydwens, Rhiannons, Rhiannons, Arthurs, Tudors, and Taliesins of tomorrow. We do not choose the names of our children lightly. You may have seen the Taj Mahal. You may have seen the pyramids. You may have seen Ayers Rock and the Golden Gate Bridge. But between you and me, until you've been to Wales.
Heritage Corporation, the world's largest producer of cultural ancestry video, is proud to bring you the story of your family name on video. It is a story that has been prepared by a team of dedicated professionals, experts in genealogy, heraldry, and history. It is the proud story of your unique heritage. On screen now is our extensive list of Irish, English, Scottish, and Welsh names currently available. Join us on a very special journey of discovery into your past.